Hi. Well, Blood, Sweat and Fear is a story of Inspector Vance and he was Vancouver's first forensic scientist. And I wanted to start by talking a little bit about how I found Vance and why I wanted to write a book about him. And while I do this, touch on a, a few of the crimes that he helped to solve. Uh, Vance started as a city analyst in 1907 and he was essentially a scientist. It was his job to make sure that the food and milk and the water supply was all fit for public consumption. And his early background was working for the mines in BC and Washington State. And this had given him a, a really solid foundation in toxicology and serology, or in other words, blood and poisons. And this all made him a real asset later on to the Vancouver Police Department. Well, I first met Inspector Vance when I was working on Cold Case Vancouver. He turned up at Jenny Conroy's crime scene. She was a 24-year-old war worker who was murdered in West Vancouver in 1944. And here's Jenny about uh, two years before she was killed. On the day that she was murdered, Jenny was supposed to be joining her family for a late Christmas dinner at a brother's house in West Vancouver. She'd finished a shift at the Grain Elevators at around five and she'd hurried home to change and then she'd rushed down to the foot of Lonsdale Avenue to catch the bus to her brother's house. And she missed the bus by less than one minute. Likely she'd started walking to the next bus stop and she was picked up somewhere along the way. But on the morning of her murder, a couple of employees of the West Vancouver Board of Works were coming back from the city dump and they saw Jenny's body on a gravel road near the Capilano View uh, Cemetery and about two kilometres away from her brother's house on Inglewood. And you can see uh, it was a pretty remote stretch of land back there. It's still uh, not all that busy. But she'd been badly beaten and her body had been dragged 47 feet along this really remote street. West Vancouver police, like most police forces, would have been severely short-staffed because of the war. And Walter Mulligan, who was at that time a detective for the Vancouver Police Department, was brought over from Vancouver to head up the investigation. Now, Walter Mulligan turns up in every book I write. It's just bizarre. And each time he's in a different role. So back then in 1944, he's five years away from becoming chief of police and would be another decade before he fled to California on corruption charges. But <laughs> back in 1944, while I'm researching Jenny's cold case murder, I'm reading about him and I see that he's joined at the crime scene by this guy called Inspector Vance, who was brought over to handle forensics. And when I read this, I thought, wow, we were doing forensics back in the 40s. That's amazing. And then I found out that we were actually doing it much, much earlier. So when I finished Cold Case Vancouver, I went to the Vancouver Police Museum just to find out more about Vance. And it turned out that he'd actually founded the building that's now the museum back in 1932. And that was the year that he was made an honorary inspector and, and given full police powers. And this was highly unusual, if not unprecedented. Uh, Vance was put in charge of the newly formed Police Bureau of Science. And the museum had a bit of information about him and some of the cases that he worked on. And you can see that the buildings here, I love this shot. You can recognize that the old, it's now the Fire Arts um, Theatre at the end, the current police museum. And next door to that was the original police headquarters all on East Cordova Street. So this was some of the articles that the police museum had on hand. And, and this just fascinated me that there was so much attention paid to this guy back in the 30s and 40s. And so I started to formulate an outline of a book in my mind. And I thought, how fun, I could write about all these really fascinating early crimes and learn a bit about forensics along the way. And Vance would be this string that kind of pulled the book together. So the book follows 10 cases that Vance worked on in, in various degrees of involvement. But part of the fun of writing this book for me was to put the stories into context with 
what was happening with Vancouver at the time. And in my opinion, Vance worked through one of the most interesting periods in Vancouver's history. He started work three months before the anti-Asian riots of 1907. He worked through the Great Depression. He worked through two world wars. And he worked for two of the most corrupt chief of police in the history of the Vancouver Police Department. One of them was Walter Mulligan. And through all this, he kept his own moral compass intact. So in the early part of last century, forensic science was really in its infancy, and it involved mostly blood work and poisons. And aside from Vance, the only other forensic lab in North America was in Montreal. And for many years, the Vancouver Police Department was the only police department in Canada that had a forensic scientist on staff and one of the few in North America that regularly used forensics in its police investigations. And to give you an example of just how leading edge this was, the FBI didn't open a lab it, until 1932 in Washington DC and Vance had already been on the job for a couple of decades. Now, this is one of the first um, newspaper articles I was able to find about Vance. It was in the province and it was written in the early 1920s. And I don't know how much you can read there, but the heading, as you can see, said Vance's skill may save man from gallows. And a lot of Vance's work and what he was really proud of was not so much getting convictions for the guilty, but using his science to prove people's innocence. And of course, they didn't muck around in the good old days. So, you know, you, you got a guilty verdict and you're off and hung. But this article was, he was still city analyst. And it says, business is good, said Mr. Vance, city analyst, as he put into operation the city's own private still in his office on the top floor of the police station. He had quite a day's work ahead of him. The city detective department had just accepted his receipt for 21 beer bottles with something in them. As these samples were secured from bootleggers, Mr. Vance had to make sure that the contents were what the label said they were. Now, one of my challenges was I have a grade 10 science education. So when I started this project, I went to the library and my desk was full of books that said things like the idiot's guide to forensics and forensics for dummies and the history of forensic, just so I could grasp what he was working on and to be able to sort of ask questions for, from scientists now and, and to get a sense of how forensics had evolved. But one of my favorite um, chapters in Blood, Sweat and Fear is, it deals with Vance's early career as city analyst and it deals with his first day on the job, which was May the 1st, 1907. Now Vance lived on Richard Street in Yale Town and his first lab was uh, at City Hall, which then was Market Hall. And it was an old, yeah, Gothic looking building that sat next to the Carnegie Library of Maine and Hastings. This photo would have been taken around 1928, just before City Hall moved to the Holden Building. Now, I have absolutely no idea how Vance got to work that first day, but I decided to use some creative license and get him to work on the streetcar. And this also gave me a really good excuse to kind of figure out what Vancouver would have looked like in 1907. So, I don't know how long it would have taken Vance to get to work that day, maybe half an hour, 20 minutes, I don't know. But it took me more than a week to get in there on paper. So the first thing I did was go to the City of Vancouver Archives website and download this map of 1907. And I punched up the section of downtown and Yale Town and blew it up into different sections and taped it up and stuck it on my wall. And then I went to William Harbeck's film from 1907. And I'm sure most of you are aware of the film. Uh, for those of you that are not, uh, Harbeck was a Seattle filmmaker who came up to Vancouver in 1907. He mounted a camera on the front of the streetcar and it's believed to be the earliest film of Vancouver. And it was lost for decades and decades, and then turned up 
not all that long ago in someone's basement in Australia. They thought they'd been looking at Hobart, Tasmania for all of that time. And the film shows the streetcar going down Granville and Hastings, the route that Vance would have taken. And here's a still that um, looks down Granville Street down to the old CPR station. And in 2007, 100 years after this film was shot, the Vancouver Historical Society recreated the route and they ran the two films side by side. And I'm so excited to tell you that it's now up on YouTube and uh, you can have a look at that. It's, it's pretty fantastic. But just to, if you look at this great old CPR building that was built around 1899, and here is a close-up now with what we did with the space. We made it into a parking lot and a cement plaza. It only lasted about 15 years. So while a lot of the buildings have been torn down, as you can imagine, I was quite surprised to see how many still exist. And I thought I'd read a little bit from the book about how Vance got to work that day on May 1st, 1907. And if everything goes well, run the clip as I read from the film. So, fingers crossed. Yes, it'll be a little bit out of sync, but hopefully it'll be, it'll work. May 1st, 1907 was John F.C.B. Vance's first day of work as city analyst. He decided to take the streetcar to City Hall, and as he strode along the raised wooden sidewalks of Smythe Street, he saw that even this early on a Wednesday morning, the city was awake. Vance turned down Granville Street, narrowly missing a man on a bicycle, who sped past him, kicking up dust from the dirt road. A banner stretched across Granville Street, boasting that, in 1910, Vancouver then, will have 100,000 men. And apart from the odd syntax, it didn't seem overly optimistic. The city's population had exploded since Vance had arrived as a 12-year-old over a decade before and was now home to 70,000 people. Vance made it to the Granville and Georgia Street stop just minutes before the tram pulled up. The corner was the social hub of the city, flanked by the 60-room Hotel Vancouver and the Opera House, both built by the Canadian Pacific Railway. The imposing Hudson's Bay department store had stood across the intersection in a red brick building since 1893. Vance paid the nickel fare and took a seat just as the conductor called all aboard and pulled two clangs on the bell rope. Vance turned to see the motorman spin the brass wheel that released the brakes and the streetcar was away. There was no glass in the windows, so he felt the cool spring air on his face. Granville Street was alive with people walking and bicycling and everyone wore hats. Women glided along in long dark skirts and horses pulled carts and buggies. Vance saw construction on every block. The new post office was going up at Hastings and Granville and there were large storage sheds on the roads outside the sites. Retail business was booming and banks were putting up substantial multi-storey buildings made of stone and brick. Vancouver was the financial and transportation centre of the province, outdoing New Westminster and Victoria with its expanding economy, and the city attracted visitors and investors from around the world, responding to the promise of vast resources, land and riches. More people arrived every week by boat and train to get a piece of the action. Speculators were already pushing land prices to ridiculous heights, and the CPR was on the verge of opening up huge tracts of land in the new neighbourhood of Shaughnessy to sell to the rich. The streetcar rattled along Hastings Street, past the courthouse at Canby Street and the offices of the Daily Province, one of three daily newspapers that collectively employed more than 100 people. The province sold for five cents and bragged that it was read in 90% of Vancouver homes. The news advertiser hit the streets each morning from its offices on Pender and Hamilton, while the world operated out of 426 Homer Street in a building designed by Samuel McClure and Richard Sharp in 1892. At Corral Street, the streetcar stopped to give way to the interurban train. Vance got ready to disembark outside the Carnegie Library at Westminster Avenue and start his first day at Market Hall. Vance's lab was in a little room at the top of the tower. Ah, that timed well, didn't it? <laughs> Yay. Oh, thank you. And thank you, William Harbeck.
Apparently there was only one car in the entire film and you'll notice that they were driving their horses down the left hand side of the road back then. Uh, a couple of buildings that were mentioned in the film and, and in the book. Uh, this was the courthouse, the original courthouse on Canby Street, uh, which is now part of Victory Square. And uh, this would have been taken in the late 1800s. It was another building that didn't last too long. It was gone by the First World War and uh, turned into a tent. And uh, this is another uh, picture of Carnegie Library and the old uh, Market Hall, which was the City Hall back in Vance's day. Now, Vance didn't have any university training at all. UBC didn't open until 1915. So most of his knowledge came from learning on the job. The first time that he was called to a crime scene was for a missing persons case in 1914. Charles and Clara Millard lived on Pendrel Street in the West End with their 16-year-old Chinese houseboy, Jack Kong. Charles was an executive with the CPR and he was away on business. And when he returned home one day, his wife was gone. Jack told him that Clara had left the house around 10.30 the previous morning, hadn't told him where she was going and hadn't returned. And after Charles phoned everyone they knew, he started to search the house. He found uh, Clara's hat and veil that she normally wore when she went out, hidden in the attic. So he called police. Now police came and they found a suspicious looking stain on the kitchen carpet. And they called in Vance, who they knew had a background in blood work, just to find out if the stain was blood and if it was blood, whether it was human. Now, this sounds ridiculously easy in the days of DNA and all the leaps and bounds that we've made in science. But back then, it was a really complicated process that involved a whole series of tests just to find out if it was blood and not red ink or ketchup, and then more tests to find out if it was human. Well, Vance was able to determine that it was both. So police ordered up a, a couple of hound dogs to come and search the house and grounds. And the, the dogs came in, ran down the stairs and sat by the furnace. Uh-oh. <laughs> so officers went down and they, they took apart the furnace, they shook out the grate, and they found pieces of um, charred bone and bits of steel corset and bucket, buckles rather, and, and garters. And they found a human thigh bone, and I love this detail, was wrapped in a copy of the province. <laughs> and it was wedged in the back of the chimney. There were cuts on the floor of the basement that look recent. And the floor, as the axe was, was exceptionally clean. And by now, no one was doubting that they'd found the missing Clara Millard. Well, Jack the houseboy finally broke down under what they used to call in the good old days the third degree questioning. And you can just imagine what they would have been like. But he told them on the morning that Mrs. Millard had gone missing. He'd brought her the wrong porridge for breakfast. Well, he refused to make her another type of porridge because he would have been late for school. And when Jack wasn't cleaning the house and chopping wood and cooking and serving meals, he went to Lloyd Roberts Elementary School, which was across the road from their house. Well, Mrs. Millard apparently didn't like to be told no, and she grabbed a knife and started chasing Jack around the house, threatening to cut off his ear. Jack was naturally scared and he pushed her and she fell and she hit her head and, and died, or at least he thought she had. And frightened that her husband would return and kill him, uh, Jack took the initiative and uh, hacked up her body and burned it in the furnace. But you have to look at this case with everything else that was going on in Vancouver at the time. There was a huge amount of racism. The Chinese had a $500 head tax, just a staggering amount of money back in 1914. It was only seven years since the anti-Asian riots had swept through Vancouver, and the Comagato was on its way to Vancouver. In fact, it was sharing headlines in the newspaper with Jack, and that was creating a whole new round of xenophobia. And you can see this um, sketch that, I guess, a, a newspaper artist has done of Jack, and they've kind of demonized this 16-year-old kid. But what I found really interesting was amid all this racism, the white jury actually believed Jack 
And instead of finding him guilty of murder, which would have come with an automatic death sentence, they brought back a verdict of manslaughter and Jack ended up serving eight years and was then deported back to China. Well, after this first police case, Van starts to become a familiar face at crime scenes and in the courtroom. And by now he's using all the tools in the forensics toolkit. He's doing ballistics and trace evidence and autopsy. He's even doing handwriting, examination. And the newspapers start to write, him about, write about him a lot and they start to treat him like a celebrity. In fact, the international press starts to call him the Sherlock Holmes of Canada. And I just love this front page of the province, in colour, no less, in 1934, above the fold, of a dog leading Vance. Now, what is that dog, you ask? Uh, it's a mechanical bloodhound, and it was one of Vance's inventions. Now, he believed that a bloodhound, that, well, his machine, rather, would act the same way as a bloodhound does when it tracks down its quarry. And his idea was that every individual has a distinct smell, like a fingerprint, which was unique just to them. And he thought if he could perfect this machine, it could be a crime detection tool, just like fingerprints were and still are. And this machine, it wasn't very big, it was the size of a kind of good sized box, I guess. And it could find individual human smells it could capture and it could record them. It could either capture an individual smell when they were wearing shoes and walking over a surface or using gloves to, to touch like a bench. Now this sounds crazy now, but at the time this idea really took off. And Vance was getting letters and interest from police forces and universities from all over the world. Now, we now know in hindsight that there were several problems with his theory. Uh, <laughs> but the main one was that um, while people do have individual odours, they don't stay the same and they change with what we eat. But odour machine failure aside, Vance's science was so successful in convicting criminals that in 1934, there were seven attempts on his life by criminals afraid to go up against his science in court. And I thought I'd just read from one of those attempts. The letter arrived at Inspector Vance's lab on February 13th, 1934. It was crudely printed on a sheet of dirty paper, lay off or we'll bump you off. The rest of the message was indecipherable. Vance phoned Deputy Chief John Murdoch, who told him that police officers often receive such letters and that he shouldn't worry. Vance filed the letter away in his drawer. A phone call followed. Lay off, Vance, or your life ain't worth a dime, said a male voice before hanging up. Now, I'm not making that up. They actually did talk like that. <laughs> On March 5th, a second threatening letter addressed to Vance arrived at the police station's general office. This one said, keep away from Sturton's trial. Vance wrote in his notebook, the letter had filthy language and asked that I wear a flower if I intended to remain away from the courtroom. Vance showed the second threatening letter to Murdoch. Again, he was told not to worry. Now, I realize this is hard to make out, but this was actually Vance's photograph of this threatening letter. And you can see the hand by the gang. <laughs> Cunningham Drug Store would eventually become part of Shoppers Drug Mart, but in 1934 it was a chain of 12 stores. In the early hours of Sunday morning, January 7th, the store in the Vancouver block on Granville Street was robbed of cash and drugs. The robbery was discovered at 4.30 a.m. and within a couple of hours, police had suspects firmly in their sights, a career criminal named George Sturton and Reginald Wolfe, a taxi driver. Wolf had rented a car from the Moonlight U Drive, which was later seen outside the drugstore at the time of the robbery. A few hours later, it was found parked in the lane behind Sturton's West End apartment and quickly traced to Wolf. Sturton had been released from prison two months before, where he'd served an 18-month sentence for possession of nitroglycerin. When police raided his Burnaby Street apartment, they found a bag of burglar's tools in the garden, 
a wrecking bar and a fenced ledge outside his door, and inside a steel punch and a key that fit the basement entrance to the Vancouver block. They also found nitroglycerin, morphine, cocaine, and my favourite, a bottle of Vaseline hair tonic, <laughs> all taken from the drugstore. The day after the second threatening letter arrived, the doorbell to Vance's lab rang. There was no one there, but he could see a man running down the stairs. Others reported seeing unknown men hanging around the hallway. The following day, Vance ignored the advice from the deputy chief and he began to worry. Vance collected his mail from the general office and took it back to his lab. He put aside some letters, picked up a bulky looking parcel and started to untie the string. He happened to glance at the printed address. The bad handwriting immediately reminded him of the writing on the warning letters that he'd received. Then with his customary patience, he slowly removed the string and unwrapped the package. Inside was a small box used to hold handkerchiefs that contained a crude but effective homemade bomb. Two wires and a detonator were fixed in such a way that if the string had been broken or jerked, the bomb would have exploded, killing Vance and taking out a significant chunk of the building and many of the people in it. Can you believe they sent this bomb through the general office mail? And this is Vance's photo of the actual bomb that he took apart. The cardboard handkerchief box was traced back to Cunningham Drugstore. Chief Cameron ordered that Vance be placed under guard at work and at home while court was in session. Now, other attempts against his life included a bomb under his office window, another bomb was put under his car, um, another time someone tampered with his brakes, but the worst one was an acid attack that tried to blind him. You can see from the, the front page story the next day uh, how serious it was. And, and what had happened, um, Vance was going to work, he'd gone out uh, to his garage at the back of his house and he noticed that a window to the garage was open so he'd reached over to close it and this man jumped up and threw a jar of acid in his face. Well, he was able to sort of stop most of the damage blinding him going into his eyes but he was severely burned. Police found this note pinned in the garage and you can see to Vance, and it's signed by Hannay's pals. Hannay, George Hannay, in fact, was a former police officer that Vance was testifying against in the NIMO the next day. And you've you got to love the criminals that signed their own names to the notes, <laughs> back then, making it difficult for the police, I guess, to, to find. When I was going through Vance's files, I, I found an article for, for, torn from a paper I'd never heard of. It was called the Vancouver Star and was around in the early 30s. And this particular newspaper article was dated uh, October 23rd, 1931 in Vance's own handwriting. And it mentioned the murder of a Japanese man named Watanabe. And Vance had obviously kept the clipping because it talked about his testimony in the court. Um, this is uh, a photo of, um, well, downtown east side now, but in 1928, when it was taken, it's at, it would have been Japantown. And you can see the American <coughs> Can Company, the big uh, five-story building that's still there on Alexander Street, and the Hastings sawmill to the right frame of the picture. Well, Watanabe's body was found on the railway tracks behind this American Can Company, and he'd been beaten to death. And Watanabe had lived uh, on a house on East Cordova Street, and it was run by another Japanese man named Sakurada. Sakurada was a 40-year-old uh, Hastings sawmill worker who'd set himself up as a medicine man, and he'd started a private hospital in his six-room East Cordova house. And remember, it was 1931, this is the Great Depression, and while it was tough for everyone, it was worse for the Japanese. And the problem was sick Japanese people would enter Sakurada's private hospital, probably because they had nowhere else to go. Then they would take out an insurance policy that named Sakurada as their beneficiary, and then they would die. And I can't tell you how thrilled I was to find the house. This is Sakurada's private hospital, still there in the 600 block of East Cordova. And actually, I wrote a blog about it um, on my blog, Every Place Has a Story, a, a 
a year or so ago. And someone actually um, left a comment saying they'd rented it in the 70s and they got cheap rent because of the, uh, the murders. So there you go, it kept going. But Watanabe had uh, injured his back on a job the previous year and he was about to receive a workers' compensation check and he planned to return to Japan the following week. Now, knowing that if Watanabe left the country, Sakurada would never see his money, he became really desperate and he hired another Japanese man to kill Watanabe. The murder was reported in the Japanese papers, but the mainstream press took little interest until police started to call the house a murder factory. And the Globe and Mail ran a national story headlined, Murder Syndicate Collects Insurance on Victims' Lives. The newspaper reported that police suspected an organized assassination ring operated in Japantown and was responsible for as many as 20 deaths. And Sakurada and his hitmen were quickly dispatched to the gallows. Vance worked all over the scene, even up in the Yukon. His career spanned 42 years and he worked on thousands of cases, murders, kidnappings, safe crackings, hit and runs, suicide. And I've chosen certain cases for the book because personally I find them fascinating, but also because they let me tease out sort of larger themes, themes such as racism, uh, police corruption, domestic violence, war and, and gangs. And in 1947, two years before Vance retired, three teenagers were planning to rob the Royal Bank at Renfrew and East First. A 17-year-old boy named William Fats Robertson was upset with his friends for leaving him out of the robbery and he dobbed them into police. So just as the boys were outside in the bank in a stolen car putting on their masks, the police rolled up and this car chase ensued across the streets of East Vancouver. And it ended with the boys bailing out of the car near the Lloyd Robert, sorry, Lloyd Nelson. Lots of Lloyds in this is Lord Nelson Elementary School and taking off towards the Great Northern Roundhouse at Clark Drive in Grandview, which was part of False Creek Flats. And this photo would have been taken a couple of years after that, probably in the early 50s, but uh, it wouldn't have changed all that much. The first officers that arrived had managed to take the gun from one of the boys, 17-year-old William Henderson, but the other two got away and it ended up in a gunfight with police. Two of these officers, Charles Boyes and Oliver Lettingham, were killed, and another was shot in the leg and shoulder, but he was still able to get off a couple of shots. One killed Doug Carter, an 18-year-old with a wife and a baby, and another killed Harry Medos, another 18-year-old who was hit in the leg. Sorry, didn't kill him, he was, he was hit in the leg. And Vance was brought in to do the firearm examination and test for gunshot residue on both the police and the boys' hands. And here he is sometime in the early 1930s, I would guess, and he's looking through a comparative microscope in his lab, looking at the bullets. So our Walter Mulligan, who was brought over to West Vancouver to investigate Jenny Conroy's murder at the beginning of my talk, well, he's now Chief of Police. And he's Vance's boss, and, and this shooting's put him in a really, really difficult position. And I was just going to read just a, a little bit about that from the book. But just two days before the shooting, Chief, Police Chief Walter Mulligan told reporters that the gloves were off in a war against city crime. And over the next 48 hours, the Vancouver Sun reported Vancouver experienced seven burglaries, two holdups, two attempted robberies, and 19 thefts. It was imperative that Mulligan sort out the recent shooting at False Creek Flats as soon as possible, and that's where Inspector Vance came in. Vance would need to determine who fired the weapons that killed three men and wounded two others. The first thing Vance needed to do was examine the hands of those involved for gunshot residue. One of the most important aspects of the trial, at least for 17-year-old William Henderson, would hinge on whether he took place in the shooting. Detective Hoare testified that he'd taken the gun from the team before the shooting started, but several witnesses swore that they'd seen him with a gun. When Vance swabbed Henderson's hands at police headquarters, he found no traces of gunpowder, corroborating the boy's story that he'd not fired a gun that day, only because police had taken it off him. 
And here's a shot of 17-year-old William Henderson from the Vancouver Police Museum, looking like he should be in a grade 12 classroom. But what fascinated me was these boys, as it turned out, were part of a lower mainland gang operation and that recruited kids aged between 13 and 18 to rob armories. And again, this is 1947, so just a few years after the Second World War had ended. Now, the guns were used then in bank holdups, like the one these boys were, were trying to pull off. And William Fats Robertson, the 17-year-old who was not invited along that day, went on to a spectacular life of crime and a career on the Vancouver Stock Exchange, <laughs> which is hard to distinguish the two, I guess. Fats Robertson was a co-owner of the Wigwam Inn on Indian Arm in the early 1960s, and he turned it into an illegal gambling joint. He printed counterfeit money out there. He ran a brothel. And he was jailed after a raid by the RCMP when he was caught trying to bribe one of the officers. After he got out of jail, he became involved in stock manipulation, drug running, and murder. And I understand he only died quite recently, which is a shame because he would have been a fascinating interview for the book. <laughs> now, Fat's problems with the RCMP and the Wigwam men happened after Vance retired in 1949, and I think it really goes to show the sheer amount of work that he handled right, for those 42 years of his career. He essentially had three jobs. He was the head of the Police Bureau of Science, he was the city analyst, and he was also the morgue toxicologist. And when Vance retired, his workload was split into two. The Police Bureau of Science was renamed the Crime Detection Laboratory and headed up by Police Inspector Percy Eastler, while Ted Fennell was appointed as a new city analyst. The city coroner service became part of the provincial system in 1980, and it's now out in Burnaby, and the Morgan autopsy facilities became part of the Vancouver General Hospital. But Vance's lab is still intact. It's part of the Vancouver Police Museum and Archives. And it really looks like people just got up for lunch back in 1996 and just forgot to come back. And everyone's been there, right? Who's been to the Vancouver Police Oh good, most of you, and if you haven't been, you need to go, it's the most fantastic building. And uh, it still has the old morgue and the autopsy suite intact. When I decided that I wanted to write a book about Vance, the, the first thing I did was visit the Vancouver Police Museum, and it really is you know, ground zero for most of us that play around in crime history. And I went there to try to track down Vance's descendants. And I was able to find his granddaughter, Janie. His daughter, Marion, was actually still alive. She's 98, uh, but she unfortunately was suffering from dementia. So she was able to talk to me a little bit about her dad. So that, that was great. And she loaned me a scrapbook. And Janie had told me that um, when Vance had retired in 1949, he packed up a lot of his files in boxes, and when he moved again in the early 60s, she remembers being a small child and helping him repack these boxes, and she remembered them having crime scene photos and, oh, manuals and newspaper clippings and, and all sorts and sorts of stuff. And she said, oh, what a shame, that must have been just thrown out decades ago. Well, I'd got hold of quite a few of the grandchildren by this point, and I called them all up and I said, it would be really great if everyone could just check your attics and basements and so forth and, and just see if you've kept anything from your grandfather. And the boxes turned up. They turned up in a grandchild's garage on Gabriola Island, seven of them. And I can't tell you, for a researcher, this is like winning the lottery. It just doesn't get better than this. But maybe the strangest thing of all is when we cracked open one of the boxes, we found this tattered envelope on top, and it's labelled Jenny Eldon Conroy, murdered West Vancouver, December 28, 1944. You remember my Jenny from Cold Case that started this whole thing? Well, it had just come full circle for me.
this was some of the evidence that was uh, in the envelope. There are a lot of smaller envelopes marked with the Vancouver Police Department insignia and inside were hair and gravel samples. I literally had Jenny's hair spilling out on my desk and gravel from the crime scene in, as you can see, this unsealed envelope from Detective Mulligan. Hopefully we treat forensics with a bit more respect these days. But he'd taken all of this home with him and I thought, how fascinating that we both shared this fascination with this kind of long forgotten cold case. I had to write a book. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. I'd love to take questions if you have any.